you here this evening not only on my own behalf, but on behalf of an organizing committee that includes Catherine Cornell, Brian Robinette, and Steve Pope. And I'd like to invite you before we begin to just dispose ourselves in gratitude to God for the time we have here together. We have very much to be thankful for as we gather in these beautiful halls that other hands have built to ponder themes worthy of our attention and care. Many benefactors and workers have made it possible for us to gather tonight. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Institute of Liberal Arts, the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences and its Dean, Father Gregory Kalsher, the Theology Department and its Chair, Professor Andrea Vicini, and the Lonergan Institute for making this evening's event possible. I would also like to mention especially the help of Patty Donnell and the Theology Department Administrator and my colleagues in the Lonergan Institute, Mary Elliott, our Assistant Director, and our Administrative Assistant, Ann McInerney, for their indefatigable support not to mention mentoring yours truly. Mary lined up the little army of graduate students, including Sean Biatri, Thomas Wilkins, Abe Wilkins. There's no coincidence that they have my name. She didn't have to look too far. <laughs> John Steichen, who designed the flyer, and so on. I'm sure I'm forgetting people. With all of this, however, let me turn over the proceedings to another esteemed colleague, approximately from the other side of the railroad tracks, remotely from the other side of the world, Professor Richard Lenan of the School of Theology and Ministry. A diocesan priest from Australia, Professor Lenan has been on the faculty of the, faculty of the School of Theology since 2007. I'm stretching things a little bit. His, it is a testament to his independence of mind that in all that time he stubbornly resisted acquiring the local accent, despite <laughs> its considerable charms. <laughs> the author of two books and the editor of five others, he is an expert on, among other things, the thought of Karl Rahner. We are very fortunate to have him here, not only tonight, but at Boston College. He's also one of the more noteworthy ecclesiologists in this town. It seemed fitting, therefore, to invite him to introduce tonight's featured speaker. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm afraid I don't cover in subtitles, so you might have to. <laughs> During one of our meetings a few years ago when we were working on what became the Boston College Statement on Priesthood, Rick described himself as an incrementalist. In context, that's someone who believes that change in the church comes about not by rapid and violent swings, but by careful, gradual, considered responses. It doesn't make for a good YouTube or TikTok video, but it has a noble heritage in the life of the church. It begins with what John Henry Newman described as the loving inquisitiveness that is at the heart of all good theology. And it proceeds by broad and deep engagement with the tradition of faith and openness to the questions of the present. And it results, as Rick's work does, in ways for the church to move beyond impasse, to see new hope and new possibilities. It results in, again, to draw on Newman in what he calls the slow, patient, anxious taking up of new truths into the reservoir of old faith. That's what Rick has done, that's what we value, that's why we are here. And as he addresses us tonight on loving and reforming 
a holy yet broken church. That's the gift we will continue to receive. So I invite you to join with me in welcoming Rick. Decades ago, a noted politician began an address at a prominent Catholic university with these words, I am a Catholic, first by birth, then by choice, and now by love. Those words could be my own. Born into a French-Canadian Catholic family, during my childhood, our practice of the faith was intermittent at best. Early in college, I left the Catholic Church for a time, attracted by the sincerity and fellowship of an evangelical group on campus. It was the gentle guidance of a young Paulist priest who had recently been assigned to the University of Texas Catholic Student Center, Father Bob Rivers, that enabled my eventual return to Catholicism. I'm honored to have him here with us this evening. Under his tutelage, I was introduced to the work of great Catholic scholars like Karl Rahner and Raymond Brown, and soon fell in love with the Catholic tradition. For more than six decades, I have come to our church's Eucharistic banquet to join what Francis Spufford terms the International League of the Guilty, <laughs> confessing our need for God's forgiveness and pleading for the prayer and support of fellow pilgrims. At that most ancient feast, I have been challenged and consoled by God's word and nourished at his table. A little more than three decades ago, surrounded by our community of faith, my wife and I pledged ourselves to each other before God and this church. And it was into this pilgrim people that we baptized our four sons. From time to time, I have been shriven by the church's ministers, and but a few months ago, amidst many of you who are here tonight, I was anointed with oils in the firm hope of healing and consolation. In this holy yet broken church, I have been inspired and challenged by our greatest saints and the simple witness of unlettered believers. I have drawn wisdom from great thinkers in our tradition and have been edified by the nimble minds and perceptive souls of so many of my esteemed colleagues. The Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie writes, to be raised Catholic is to be inducted into a culture that clings, that slides between your soul's crevices and stays, unquote. Or, to put the matter more plainly, I am a Catholic down to my bones and deeply grateful for it. Yet my spiritual pilgrimage in this community of faith has also been marked by experiences of deep pain and long stretches of festering resentment. For it is in this same church that as a socially awkward teenager, I was groomed by a predator priest who would go on to abuse dozens of other young males before eventually being removed from priestly ministry. 
I have known countless remarkable women who have suffered because their gender mattered more than their gifts. I have watched with heart-piercing sadness as one of my own sons felt he had no choice but to leave the church of his childhood, not because he had abandoned the faith, but because he had fallen in love with someone of the same sex. I have grieved over my church's callous presumption, arrogant exclusions, and misplaced certitudes, and have at times been more ashamed of my church than moved to love it. Romana Gordini, the noted liturgical scholar, bluntly describes the often harsh demands of belonging to such a broken community of faith. For him, quote, being Catholic means to affirm the church as it is, together with her tragedy. This, of course, presupposes that we have the courage to endure a state of permanent dissatisfaction. And the more deeply a person realizes who God is, the loftier their vision of Christ and his kingdom, the more keenly will they suffer from the imperfections of the church. There is no place for a church of esthetes, an artificial construction of philosophers. The church we need is a church of human beings. Unquote. Bearing this permanent dissatisfaction is not easy. Yet I remain convinced that it is only out of a deep love for the church and a profound belief in its mission that we can hope to achieve the authentic reform it so desperately requires. There was a time when the holiness of the church, one of its essential marks, required little defense. Yet for many of us today, in the face of seemingly endless scandal, it is the church's sinfulness, not its holiness, that requires little defense. The church's many failings are easy for all to see. How can we continue to speak of such a church as holy? It is a fair question. However, we must keep in mind that the church's holiness has never been a matter of its own achievement. If the church is holy, it is only because Christ has not abandoned it, and his promised spirit remains in spite of the many impediments we place before it. I'm reminded of an interview that transpired some years ago with a well-known prelate who was asked if it was the Holy Spirit who chose the Pope in conclave. The prelate cautiously demurred, responding, I would say that the Spirit does not exactly take control of the affair, but rather like a good educator, as it were, leaves us much space, much freedom, without entirely abandoning us. <laughs> Thus, the Spirit's role should be understood in a much more elastic sense, and that he dictates the candidate, and that he does not dictate the candidate for whom one must vote. Indeed, probably the only assurance the Spirit offers is that the thing cannot be totally ruined. <laughs> there are too many contrary instances of popes the Holy Spirit would obviously not have picked. <laughs> it may surprise some here to learn that that prelate was then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, speaking almost two decades before his own papal election. The Spirit's ongoing activity does not exempt the church from grievous sin, nor does it protect the church from corruption or prevent us from placing significant impediments before the work of the Spirit. Indeed, it is the very impulse of the Spirit that animates the work of ecclesial reform. And so this evening, in keeping with the genre of a last lecture, I would like to offer some extended reflections on a commitment that has been central to my own work for more than three decades, namely, providing an adequate theological foundation for meaningful and lasting ecclesial reform. <laughs> 
I will explore this evening three tasks that require particular attention today as we pursue the work of reform. First, we must properly engage the institutional dimension of the church. Second, we must pursue a reflective equilibrium between the claims of authoritative tradition and the demand for responsible ecclesial critique. Third, we must fully realize the contributions of the sense of the faithful. The first task requires that in the work of ecclesial reform, we commit ourselves to properly engaging the church's institutional dimension. This is not as easy as it sounds, but today the term institutional church carries largely pejorative connotations, associated as it is with every form of ecclesiastical dysfunction. The many flaws and failings of the institutional church are, are often set in opposition to some more idealized ecclesial vision. This tendency is in keeping with a broader anti-institutional bias in our culture. In his book, On Thinking Institutionally, the political scientist Hugh Hecklow documents in disheartening detail numerous breaches of public trust by institutions in the private, public, and non-profit sectors going back to the 1960s. In the face of this broader cultural distrust of institutions and the widespread Catholic disillusionment with the church's institutional failings, it is all the more important that we avoid any romantic pining for a church set free from the constraints of institutional reality. After all, institutions when functioning well, are but a spatial and temporal extension of the fundamentally social character of human nature. Certainly, we must not reduce the church to its institutional reality, but any sweeping dismissal of the institutional life of the church in service of church reform will be both, mis both misguided and doomed to failure. In his recent book, The Truth at the Heart of the Lie, the noted columnist and longtime Catholic commentator, James Carroll, offers a passionate argument for abandoning the Catholic Church as an institution, which he is convinced is now beyond reform. Carroll laments the failed promise of both Vatican II and the Francis Pontificate, and argues that Catholics today have little recourse save to pursue a new and radically de-institutionalized church. This new church would have no need of a sacramental priesthood, nor of a doctrinal teaching office. In pursuit of this new ecclesial reality, Carol is content to cherry-pick salvageable elements from the Catholic tradition. He is eager to retain, for example, Catholic worker houses, select religious orders, Catholic social teaching, while repudiating large swaths of the church's ancient theological tradition, including contributions of figures like St. Augustine and St. Anselm, whom he blames for bequeathing to the church a, quote, doom-threatening monster god, unquote. He imagines the church as a loose confederation of small intentional communities that celebrate the Eucharist without any need for ordained ministers at all. How such a church is to stay moored to its ancient roots and heritage, how it is to identify the counterfeit versions of the gospel, how it is to preserve the substantive unity and communion of 1.2 billion believers, None of this is entirely clear from what he proposes. But the appeal is undeniable. I understand Carol's frustration with the church, particularly in the decades since the Council, when there had been so much hope for comprehensive reform. 
But I remain convinced that if reform of the church is to be lasting and meaningful, we have to acknowledge the necessity of many of the church's offices and structures. Our task, I believe, is to understand better how such social structures actually function in our world, while also considering their proper role in the mission of the church. And this requires the kind of rigorous theological, historical, and sociological analysis that, frankly, is not always sufficiently developed in many reformist agendas. Consider, for example, the associations that arise when the term hierarchy is employed with insufficient historical and theological rigor. We are well aware of those on the Catholic right who, largely ignorant of serious historical scholarship, contend that the church hierarchy as we know it today belongs to the very will of Christ. For them, an ecclesiastical hierarchy is essential for preserving a monarchical, absolute, and omnicompetent ecclesial authority. Yet decades ago, the great Dominican ecclesiologist E. Congar distinguished between the legitimate place for ecclesiastical order and that deeply problematic form of hierarchy that has its remote origins in the Gregorian reforms of the 11th century and which found its modern realization in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Congar knew well that the term hierarchy could refer to quite different ecclesial forms. By contrast, for many on the Catholic left, the term hierarchy has now become synonymous with patriarchy, kyriarchy, and the hegemonic and colonialist prerogatives of empire. In much of today's theological literature, the mere attribution of the term hierarchy or hierarchical to a given social structure or ideological schema is sufficient to forestall any further consideration. Yet, from a social scientific perspective, hierarchies of one kind or another are inevitable in any large-scale organization. As Luca Benini notes, the term hierarchy in itself merely refers to, quote, a chain of norms or authorities, each subordinate to the next higher link and superior to those below it. This minimal understanding of hierarchy he contends, is relatively uncontroversial and has been retained by contemporary sociology and political philosophy." Unquote. The moment any of us walks into a classroom or a court of law, we consent to a hierarchical arrangement of one kind or another. At their best, Social hierarchies allow for coordinated action and an efficient distribution of responsibilities. They can also reduce social tension by clarifying roles and lessening harmful rivalries. Within any society, in any large-scale organization, there will always be basic hierarchies of knowledge, wisdom, competence, and responsibility, and those hierarchies will require an appropriate delegation of power and authority. What we must renounce is not hierarchy itself, but certain hierarchical schemas in which power is exercised along an exclusively downward vector, while accountability is exercised along an exclusively upward vector. The late Terence Nichols, in his study of the history of hierarchy in the church, noted the existence in our tradition of two quite different versions of hierarchy. The first, which he terms command hierarchy, is what most of us have in mind when we denounce the multitudinous forms of institutional oppression in the church. The second, participative hierarchy, 
a minority tradition, to be sure, has been preserved at various points in our tradition, however imperfectly, often in many professed religious communities. And it actually looks a lot like what Pope Francis has in mind when he invokes the language of synodality. Now, frankly, because of its negative connotations, I am more inclined to avoid the term hierarchy altogether and speak instead of the church as an ordered communion. As such, the church is sustained by social structures that facilitate the appropriate distribution and exercise of power and authority within a non-competitive theological framework and in service of the church's life and mission. But let's be clear, whatever term we use, structural distributions of power and authority are inevitable in the church, as in any large-scale organization. Lasting institutional reform will require not only sound historical and theological study, but careful sociological analysis as well. I have found the contributions of critical realist sociology of particular value because of the way in which this particular sociological school forces us to consider the proper roles of personal agency, social structures, and culture in a given social situation. Let me explain. Meaningful human agency is always subject to both structural and cultural constraints and conditions. We always, we always engage in social action within a given social context, one usually defined by a social structure, by which I mean a set of positional relations that we have not defined, but which we are subsequently free to reproduce, to modify, or to resist. In the church, a social structure might be as simple as the sacrament of reconciliation, marked by the positional relations of confessor and penitent. But they may also include more complex social entities, organizations like a, a parish, diocese, seminary, religious order, monastery, or the Roman curia. Let us consider the parish as a social structure. As a layperson, when I join a parish, I immediately enter into an already established positional relation to the pastor and to other parishioners. These positional relations are generally codified by law and custom and are underwritten by certain theologies that are part of the parish's specific ecclesial culture. The enablements and restrictions associated with these structures are crucial for understanding how such social structures work. On the one hand, these structures enable the priest to provide pastoral leadership of the parish. They enable him to preside and preach at the liturgy. But the parish positional structure also imposes constraints. The priest is not free to simply make up his own liturgical rite or substitute random readings for those in the lectionary. Now, these enablements and constraints would seem to most of us to be pastorally prudent. On the other hand, the same structure also enables the pastor to make important pastoral decisions without having to consult parishioners. And it prohibits competent laypersons with a demonstrated charism for preaching from doing so in the Eucharistic liturgy. These enablements and restrictions, by contrast, appear to many of us deeply problematic. But my point, my larger point, is that effective ecclesial reform requires an understanding of how concrete social structures influence, but do not determine the agency of those who participate in these structures. 
Consequently, effective ecclesial reform will have to carefully consider the specific restrictions and enablements associated with concrete structures. Only then would we be in a position to produce a concrete agenda for a meaningful structural change. The second task in the work of ecclesial reform requires us to pursue a reflective equilibrium between the authoritative claims of our tradition and the need for responsible ecclesial critique. Very early in my adult faith, I recognized the need and value for a religious tradition that was at least in some sense authoritative. At that time, however, my view of the Catholic tradition was highly romanticized. Since then, study and experience have disabused me of the worst of that Catholic romanticism as I became acutely aware, intellectually and existentially, of our tradition's blind spots and distortions. Nevertheless, when asked by many of my students, and even my own sons, why I remain convinced that belonging to the church can make a difference in our lives, my answer, I believe, has been consistent. If we are to flourish as humans, we need authoritative narratives, transformative practices, inherited wisdom, and exemplary figures, all of which are capable of positively shaping our habits, our affections, and our imaginations. For under the conditions of sin and left to our own devices, we humans are inclined to avoid the kinds of difficult personal transformations that are necessary for maturation and authentic human flourishing. As with other great and distinguished religious traditions, Catholicism offers its own authoritative tradition of meaning and practice. It is a tradition which, at its best, can school us as disciples of Jesus of Nazareth working in service of God's coming reign. It can enable us, as St. Paul put it, to be ever more conformed to the mind of Christ. I understand, of course, why for many today, submitting to the authoritative claims of a religious tradition, tradition doesn't seem particularly appealing. Catholicism, in particular, faces a huge credibility crisis instigated by the clerical sexual abuse scandal and the Church's controversial exclusionary policies and teachings. Today, submission to an authoritative tradition of any kind can only appear constraining and affront to the values of freedom, choice, and personal autonomy. Yet a more penetrating reading of our cultural landscape quickly unmasks the myth of radical autonomy. Here in the West, we are immersed in a broad consumer culture that imposes on us its own socially embodied traditions of consumer culture, traditions of meaning and practice. The Reformed theologian James A. Smith cleverly describes a trip to the shopping mall as a quasi-religious pilgrimage. This pilgrimage is replete with its own authoritative narratives, priests, exemplary figures, icons, and reiterated bodily practices. This consumerist tradition of meaning and practice, Smith argues, shapes our affections and imaginations every bit as profoundly as does a formal religious tradition. When we see our culture in this light, the question is no longer whether we should submit to the authoritative claims of a tradition, but to which tradition will we be subject? 
We are certainly free to forsake a religious tradition, but in doing so, are we not opening ourselves up to the influence of less explicit, less formal, and yet perhaps even more dysfunctional social mechanisms that will shape us all the more profoundly because of their ubiquity and invisibility. So again, one of the tasks we must set for ourselves in the work of ecclesial reform concerns how best to receive and interpret our own authoritative religious tradition. And that task, in turn, requires holding in a reflective equilibrium two necessary interpretive stances towards our tradition. First, an affirmative hermeneutic of trust that remains confident in the tradition's ability to faithfully mediate the gospel of Jesus Christ and the path to authentic discipleship. Second, a critical hermeneutic of suspicion that exposes our tradition's biases, blind spots, and distortions. The pursuit of this reflective equilibrium is central to the work of ecclesial reform because, sadly, much of what divides our church today stems from an inability to hold these two stances in productive tension. The capacity for trust lies at the heart of our Christian faith. Our relationship with God requires a stance of radical trust in God's graciousness. The integrity of the Christian life depends on our fundamental trust in the good news of Jesus Christ as testified to in Scripture and tradition. Yet we know all too well how a simplistic and exclusive reliance on a hermeneutic of trust can easily devolve into dangerous forms of fundamentalism that ignore our tradition's capacity for distortion. For this reason, our church owes a debt of gratitude to the work of historians, feminists, and liberation theologians, and with trained practitioners of decolonial and intersectional analyses, these critical tools and methods have helped us identify clericalist, gendered, racial, and socioeconomic oppressions perpetuated systemically in our tradition. I have personally learned a great deal from colleagues, and particularly my students, who have put these critical tools to effective use. Yet, if the danger of an ahistorical Catholic fundamentalism remains real and pressing in the church today, so too is the danger of an exclusive and one-sided preoccupation with the work of critique. As the literary theorist Rita Felsky observes, we should not, after all, assume that suspicion is an intrinsic good or a guarantee of rigorous or radical thought. She fears that critique can easily morph from a useful and even necessary method to a pervasive mood in which the only perceived alternative to critique is complacency, credulity, and conservatism. This disposition toward endless critique is reflected in the ubiquity in our academic jargon of verbs like to interrogate, to problematize. Our church today is paying the price for our failure to maintain a reflective equilibrium between these two hermeneutical stances. We are becoming divided into two camps, those who embrace the tradition whole cloth as a reality that stands entirely above and beyond critique, and those whose sweeping denunciations leave us only a few salvageable fragments of a largely failed tradition. In much of my previous work, I have challenged the dangers of a naive, a historical and ill-informed trust in the tradition. So if you will permit me, let me suggest two temptations associated with the admittedly 
necessary work of ecclesial critique. The first is the temptation to a kind of pseudo-propheticism. Biblical prophets, we would do well to remember, were frequently pariahs, offering an uncomfortable message to a largely unreceptive audience. Yet today, in certain quarters, merely the whiff of being prophetic carries not a program, but untrammeled adulation. Among more progressive reformist Catholics, and I must say that I conclude to myself in their number, there is a temptation to applaud any and all criticisms leveled at church authorities, church structures, or the received tradition, regardless of the objective merits of the critique itself. Today's social media culture privileges those voices who learned how to offer the hot take. The more provocative the critique, the more likely the critic is to be lionized as a prophet, again, at least in some circles. In both theology and church activism, we can recognize the charismatic aura bestowed on the figure of the dissident critic. In our current climate, any effort to consider whether the critical methods we employ might themselves be in need of responsible critique is to risk being identified with the other camp. This leads me to a second temptation. Succumbing to what Pope Francis has termed the virus of polarization. Examples of this virus are everywhere in our larger society. We become attached to certain group entities, not just because we agree with the tenets of that particular group, but because of what belonging to that group says about us. In a recent New York Times piece on partisan divides in COVID, one progressive activist remarked, quote, the inconvenience of having to wear a mask is more than worth it to have people not think I'm a conservative, unquote. <laughs> Both our actions and the positions we espouse can be motivated more than we want to believe by how we wish to be perceived by others. This preoccupation with signaling a certain kind of identity can lead to what Dan Cahan refers to as identity protective cognition. Cahan has in mind a cognitional habit that is highly resistant to factual information or counterarguments. I know who you're thinking of. <laughs> that might challenge our group identity. We have, he notes, a deep felt need for our people to be right. Indeed, getting it right as an expression of a rigorous commitment to getting at the truth of things, regardless of the consequences, becomes less important than protecting our tribal identities. Under the sway of identity protective cognition, as Jonathan Haidt points out, we all function more like press secretaries, charged with spin. We set out to marshal facts and arguments, sometimes little more than vague talking points, in support of a predetermined position, one attached to our group or party. We see this everywhere in our political discourse, but this virus has infected our ecclesial and theological discourses as well, and across the ideological spectrum. We are increasingly divided into distinct ideological and identitarian tribes that mimic the demonizing rhetoric of contemporary political discourse. Yet here's the thing. Most of us can recognize this phenomenon, but only in our opponents. We are largely blind to the possibility that we too could be subject to this same cognitional habit. What is the solution? It certainly doesn't lie in the pursuit of some vague theological centrism. 
Such a strategy too easily overlooks the often stark asymmetries regarding what divides us. Advocates and opponents of the death penalty can't hope to just meet in the middle somewhere. Such a split the difference mentality also ignores the possibility of a genuine impasse that may forestall easy resolution in the current moment. Rather, as Pope Francis has frequently suggested in his appeals for a culture of encounter, the solution must lie in a commitment to sustain the dialogical processes and the cultivations of habits, practices, and dispositions that can transform our affective attachments and tribal tendencies and encourage us to engage with love and care those with whom we disagree. But for this to happen, we have to seek out ways to break down our tribal walls. This is no easy task, as these walls are often reinforced by Catholic social media, dueling activist movements, and even the distinct ideological orientations of our various professional theological societies and programs of advanced theological formation. Moreover, Maintaining a reflective equilibrium between the authoritative claims of our tradition and responsible critique is a task not only for theologians and church activists, but for all baptized Christians committed to an authentic way of being church. As baptized Christians called to discipleship in a holy yet broken community, all of us are called to pursue a path between an uncritical adherence to the received tradition and a reflexive repudiation of everything we find difficult and challenging. We are called, like Jacob who once grappled with an angel of the Lord, to wrestle with our tradition, with all its gifts and failings, until the break of dawn. If our second task concerns how best to engage the authoritative claims of our tradition, our third and final task is concerned with ensuring that Vatican II's teaching on the sense of the faithful fulfills its necessary role in the development of that tradition. Vatican II boldly taught that all the baptized, and not just the magisterium, the teaching authority of Pope and bishops, share in the active reception of God's revelation in the life of the church. An explicit theology of the sense of the faithful, as John Burkhardt has noted in his recent monograph, has its origins in the 19th century work of theologians like Giovanni Parone, John Henry Newman, and Matthias Schaeber. Yet their creative explorations of the active role of all the baptized in the transmission and development of our faith tradition would be largely quashed after Vatican I. Between Vatican I and Vatican II, when the sense of the faithful was treated at all, it was generally reduced to the laity's passive acknowledgement of and submission to the teaching of the magisterium. Vatican II was able to recover and expand upon that earlier trajectory associated with Newman and others by developing a more charismatic and dialogical theology of divine revelation. The Council presented revelation not primarily as data or doctrine, but as an event of divine self-communication in which God shares God's very self with us in a person. Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Spirit. This living word is offered not just to the Pope and bishops, but to the whole Christian faithful. Although according to the Council, it is the distinctive task of the magisterium to offer an authoritative interpretation of God's word, all the baptized are called to exercise their own supernatural instinct for the faith, the census today. This 
instinct is itself a gift of the Holy Spirit and it allows ordinary believers to receive God's word, to probe its depths and creatively apply it in their daily lives. Pope Francis has retrieved this conciliar tradition and he has in fact made it central to his vision for a synodal church. His creative reception and development of the Council's teaching on the sense of the faithful illuminates for us both its unrealized potential and the dangers of its minimization or misappropriation. First, Francis believes that the sense of the faithful can contribute to the development of doctrine. The Pope has regularly complained about a sterile and ahistorical dogmatism that refuses to recognize the possibility of real and substantive change within our tradition. For a small but vocal and frankly moneyed minority of neoconservatives, radical traditionalists and the like, the Council's teaching on the sense of the faithful has little to offer. Yet authentic ecclesial reform requires our confidence that the Spirit can speak through the quotidian wisdom of all God's people. Might the faithful's insight into God's Word and their attentiveness to the impulse of the Spirit move the church toward new appropriations of that one revelation coming to us in Christ? Might that lead in turn to specific shifts, develops, developments, and perhaps even reversals in church doctrine? Pope Francis has at least hinted at just such a possibility in Amoris Laetitia, where he suggests that in certain pastoral circumstances, those in irregular marriages might legitimately receive the Eucharist. Second, Although the sense of the faithful can contribute to the development of doctrine, Francis does not reduce the sense of the faithful to a kind of proto-doctrine, the value of which would depend on its subsequent official formulation. No, for him, the sense of the faithful refers first of all to the people's lived faith. This lived faith has an intrinsic value regardless of whether it subsequently acquires more official doctrinal formulations. Third, the Pope has warned against projecting our own ideological commitments onto the sense of the faith. Here, we might recall the temptation to ideological tribalism that I mentioned earlier. We theologians and church activists are often tempted to appeal to anecdotal evidence regarding what the people believe, or to surveys that conveniently support our own positions. Following John Paul II, Francis agrees that the sense of the faithful cannot be reduced to public opinion. Moreover, drawing on the distinctive reception of the conciliar teaching by the churches of the global south, Francis insists that the census today not, is not the exclusive possession of a few educated elites or the more enlightened churches of North America and Western Europe. He enjoins us to listen as well to the wisdom and witness of the poor and marginalized throughout the global church and to resist forms of ideological colonization. Although this last expression is often associated with Francis' controversial criticisms of gender theory, we should recall that ideological colonization can be imposed from both the far left and the far right. The commitment to listening to the voices of the poor and marginalized was on full display at the Pan-Amazonian Synod, which offered numerous opportunities to learn from the many indigenous communities of that region. In all of this, the Pope is not trying to pit regional churches against one another, or theologians against ordinary believers, but he is convinced 
that in considering the wisdom of ordinary faithful, we must go beyond the views of our own ideological tribe. That being said, were I to have the Pope's ear, and I most decidedly do not, I would applaud his expansion of the scope of the census fidelium to include the voices of the poor and marginalized, while perhaps gently reminding him that the marginalized today also include many women and LGBTQ persons whose stories and perspectives he has yet to engage sufficiently and without restrictive ecclesiastical filters. If the insights of the faithful are to contribute in the fullest possible way to the work of ecclesial reform, we will need to pursue with more unambiguous papal support the transformation of current ecclesial structures and the creation of new ones better equipped for engaging the insights and concerns of the whole people of God. We ecclesiologists can do our part by undertaking more explicit ethnographic research into the lived faith of concrete Christian communities. This kind of qualitative analysis can do much to fill out and complexify our apprehension of the lived faith of the people of God. And as we plumb the insights of all God's people, we must be sure to consider the insights of Christians who are not in full, visible communion with the Roman Catholic Church. This is why the patient work of ecumenical dialogue, formal and informal, remains as important to the Church as ever. We must also find ways to access the distinctive insights of those believers who reluctantly left the Church for what they see as better and healthier ecclesial pastors or who now find themselves in a reluctant state of ecclesial exile. Their insights, their hopes, their pains and disillusionments also have much to offer us. Finally, we must be careful not to romanticize this notion of the sense of the faithful. Not all believers have been formed equally in the faith of the church, nor are all equally engaged in the life of discipleship. Surely, the extent of one's faith formation and spiritual commitment, however difficult to assess objectively, will at least influence every believer's comprehension of God's word in their daily lives. At the same time, the faithful's rights to have their insights acknowledged is not grounded primarily in their advanced theological education or in mature ecclesial practice, but in their baptismal vocation and the gift of the Spirit. As Thomas Aquinas teaches, our best wisdom in this life comes not from learning, but from love. Let me conclude my reflections on this third task by echoing a concern John Burkhardt expressed regarding the widespread ignorance among many believers regarding the Council's teaching on the sense of the faithful. He remarks, quote, if more Catholics believe that their engagement was welcome in the church, I submit that the scandals rocking the church today would be less an occasion for their leaving the church and more an incentive to all believers to tackle these problems." Unquote. To this I can only add a resounding Amen. As many here know, on February 22nd, this past spring, I was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer with a life expectancy of about 13 months. This particularly aggressive cancer, and the chemotherapy being marshaled against it, has forced me to contend rather intensely with the finitude, brokenness, and the suffering that is our lot, all of us, 
as God's creatures. And faced with the seemingly capricious and arbitrary character of that suffering, I must confess to having more than once hurled my complaints heavenward against the seeming injustice of it all. But I have learned, oh so very slowly, that a time often comes when our laments and our protests justifiable in their own right, must yield to a more contemplative posture. For there we are invited into the gracious mystery of divine providence, in which even as we realize that the complete eradication of suffering and injustice eludes us, God's grace still abounds. The work of meaningful ecclesial reform may call us down a similar path. Far too many today have experienced the church's brokenness more than its holiness. Seeking the compassion and consolation of Christ, they were met only with exclusion, callous indifference, or harsh judgment. This is a scandal. And in response to it, our ecclesial laments, protests, and demands for reform are entirely, entirely appropriate and necessary. We are always called to remedy suffering and injustice where we are able. And yet, in the midst of our justifiable outrage in the church's many feelings, here too, something of a contemplative posture may be necessary. For in my own suffering journey, it remains this holy yet broken church for all its egregious failings that has continued to sustain me. It is within the gentle embrace of this flawed community that I am showered daily with the prayerful support of countless fellow pilgrims many in this room, and in remembered at each Sunday liturgy in my home parish. The sad taint of clericalism has not and cannot obscure the consolation and spiritual nourishment I continue to find in our church's sacramental life. The ancient gospel wisdom that life comes only through death and human fulfillment only in love of neighbor still reverberates in my soul from across the ages. Each Sunday, that startling Paschal truth is enacted in even the most tepid liturgies. The jarring arrogance and hypocrisy of so many of my fellow Christians cannot shout down the inspiring witness of those precious friends of God and prophets past and present, who have illumined for me a path to God. The work of ecclesial reform remains more necessary today than ever. I refuse to believe that the church's failings, abuses, and dysfunctions are beyond the reach of the Spirit's healing and repair. However incomplete that work may be this side of the eschaton. But let us never forget that in the church's failings we are confronted at least in part with our own awkward brokenness. And let us be consoled in recalling that in the midst of our personal and our ecclesial suffering, the spirit of the crucified one still abides, gently extending a healing touch and calling us ever more tenderly, yet insistently, to our one true home. Thank you.